Hello friends, uh, in our last lecture we started talking about uh, optical receivers and uh, uh, in an optical receiver we said the front end is going to be a photodiode which uh, takes the optical radiation, the incoming optical radiation and produces a corresponding photo current and uh, that photo current would need to be converted to a voltage and uh, that is done using a transipedance amplifier and with further amplification uh, it is typically fed into a analog to digital converter and then uh, that is interfaced with the data equation circuit right so this is typically the optical receiver uh, that we uh, see uh, that that needs to be uh, designed uh, for any sensor application uh, we looked at the example of uh, a pin photodiode uh, we looked at why we need a PIN photodiode, uh, why we need that PIN structure and then we started looking at some of the characteristics of the PIN photodiode in terms of its responsivity as well as the uh, response time uh, which uh, can also be quantified in terms of the bandwidth of the uh, overall receiver. Um, so we stopped at the point where uh, we defined uh, the responsivity R as uh, eta Q over H nu, right? That's in terms of ampere watt. And since uh, Q, H, and uh, nu can be written as C over lambda, uh, since uh, Q, H, and C are all constants, uh, we actually simplified this and said this is eta times lambda over uh, a constant value 1.24 when uh, lambda wherein lambda is expressed in terms of uh, micrometers okay so let us see what this means um, if we have uh, let's say a microwatt of uh, light incident on this right then uh, what is the corresponding uh, photo currents that generated well um, we can look at the responsivity of the photodiode for that. Um, let's say uh, if uh, lambda is uh, 1.55 microns, okay, 1.55 micron happens to be uh, a very popular uh, telecommunication wavelength. So let's let's say for ease of availability of components, let's choose uh, lambda equal to 1.55 micron, which uh, material would you use to pick up uh, radiation at 1.55 micron that would be uh, indium gallium arsenide uh, detector let's say we have one of those detectors and uh, for indium gallium arsenide if you design um, your structure right uh, meaning you are uh, having enough width so that uh, you can uh, pick up uh, most of the light you can absorb most of the light uh, that's incident on the photodiode, um, you can achieve typically values in the order of uh, 0 0.09, sorry, 0 0.9. Um, if we plug in these values, then uh, we find that R is now point, point 0.9 multiplied by 1.55 divided by 1.24 and uh, if you quickly do the math, uh, that would correspond to about uh, 1.1 amp per watt, right? So that's the kind of number that you get for the responsivity. So what that means is if I have one uh, microwatt of uh, uh, power that's, uh, uh, that, that's falling on the photodiode, that's actually incident on the photodiode, then the photodiode would... Um, say uh, generate about 1.1 micro micro amp of current so i'll just say approximately 1 uh, micro amp of current okay and uh, this needs to be converted to a voltage and then maybe amplified uh, uh, in in terms of its amplitude and then finally uh, you are amplifying the signal so that it fills the adc so if you take a 10 bit adc you have uh, 1024 uh, levels in that 
and uh, if it if the ADC has a swing of uh, 0 to 1 volt um, let's say if you want to use all the bits of the ADC okay you need to fill the ADC which means that you need to boost up the signal which is uh, say 1 microamp right that's the maximum that's falling on the uh, photodiode I mean uh, so maximum photo current that's generated um, you need to convert that to um, 1 volt so what is the transipedance gain you need well you, you can calculate the transipedance gain here gain is going to be 1 volt divided by 1 microamp so um, that will be 1 uh, mega ohm right so 1 mega ohm is the transipedance gain that you need um, so yes you say okay 1 mega ohm what's the problem with that well we will see what what might be a problem with this uh, a little later on but just give you a hint um, the am these amplifiers are typically op amp based amplifiers and the uh, these amplifiers would have a, a certain uh, you know bandwidth uh, gain product or a gain bandwidth product okay so what that means is if if for example uh, you take an op amp 741 it has a gain bandwidth product in the order of uh, uh, 1 meg what that means is you can get 1 meg transipedance gain using this uh, op amp but uh, that will come for only 1 hertz of, uh, uh, of, of bandwidth on the other hand if you want to have at least 1 kilohertz of bandwidth then you are limited to a gain of only 1 kilo ohm okay so issues like that uh, can can actually uh, put a limitation on this and these are issues that we will come back and look at little more detail uh, slightly later but uh, the other aspect is any noise that you have in your photodiode that you generate from your photodiode maybe because of incoming light itself is noisy or maybe there are some processes within the photodiode that generate that noise any noise that you generate there is is actually going to be let's call it uh, n of t right so this tends to be like an additive noise on the signal that you are trying to um, uh, capture here that noise is going to be also amplified by this uh, one mega ohm, right? So, so this is actually uh, an, an important aspect to note. The signal to noise ratio in your receiver is going to be highest at the front end. It cannot improve, you know, as you uh, go further down the receiver. Okay, there is a misconception that oh, I can. Uh, put amplifiers and I can improve the signal to noise ratio no that's not what's happening whenever you put an amplifier you are boosting up the signal but you are also boosting up the noise by the same level okay so uh, the signal to noise ratio can only degrade as it goes through all these amplifiers because the amplifiers also add extra noise okay so it will further degrade the signal to noise ratio that you have so it's very very important that uh, you need to have as high signal to noise ratio as possible right at the front end itself and uh, uh, the, the related question is um, can the responsivity be increased somehow okay is is that possible at all okay well it turns out that is possible and uh, uh, and and that is actually through uh, what we call as uh, an avalanche photodiode so let's actually look at what uh, avalanche photodiodes mean 
Okay. So, we did look at this concept a little earlier that as you increase your um, uh, electric field, okay, as you increase your electric field inside your semiconductor uh, uh, photodiode, you have, uh, especially at the, at the junctions, you have, uh, you know, uh, you, you are under the influence of drift uh, mechanism and uh, in, under that influence, your velocity of the carriers can be increased, okay. So, suppose you are uh, going to uh, very high field levels, let us say field levels in the order of 10 power 5 uh, volt per centimeter, okay. If, if you have, if you have that sort of field levels, that is very close to the breakdown strength of the material itself. Under those intense fields, the carriers are, uh, you know, uh, are, are subjected to uh, so much uh, high momentum right, uh, they carry so much momentum that they could impede, uh, they could, they could actually collide with atoms in the, in the, in the overall uh, uh, matrix, right. And uh, you could essentially, when, when it collides with the at, uh, atoms with such high momentum, uh, it ends up generating, it, it basically uh, knocks off electrons from the valence orbital, okay. So, in this case, in, you know, you can look at it as uh, electrons going from the uh, valence band to the conduction band. Once it gets knocked off from the atom, you know, it goes into the conduction band. So, whenever that happens, of course, it also leaves behind a hole, okay. So, you generate an electron, a secondary electron hole pair due to this primary uh, electron that is travelling with very high velocity, okay. So, this process is uh, what we call as impact ionization, okay. And impact ionization essentially means that you can start with one electron and that actually generates an electron hole pair, right. And uh, then it still has, because the momentum has transferred to this new electron. Now, the, that electron can still have enough momentum that that generates secondary electron hole pairs and so on, right. And, and similarly, uh, if the hole also is moving with uh, fairly high velocity, the hole can go and generate secondary electron hole pairs as well. So, uh, that, that could also participate in this impact ionization, okay. So, through the process of impact ionization, you are essentially multiplying the electron hole pairs generated by, where is it all triggered? It is generated by absorption of a photon, okay. So, you, you start with absorption of a photon that generates an electron hole pair, but under intense electric fields that can generate secondary and, and further electron hole pair. So, there could be a, a multiplication happening and that multiplication process can lead to an avalanche and uh, that is why uh, such photodiodes are called avalanche photodiodes. Okay. So, let us actually look into this a little more detail. Let us say the impact ionization uh, can be expressed in terms of alpha. So, I can uh, draw a graph where alpha, which is typically expressed in terms of inverse centimeters, can be uh, plotted as a function of uh, the magnitude of the electric field. And I would say, uh, Let us look at this magnitude in terms of 10 power 5 volt per centimeter, okay. So, 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on 
and on the y axis this could be 1, 10 power 3, 10 power 6 even, yeah, that is a huge number. So, we can get multiplicative gains in the order of 10 power 6 even with the uh, um, uh, with, with this impact ionization process. Okay. Um, so, how does this look uh, say for uh, silicon um, or, or for indium gallium arsenide let us say start with uh, indium gallium arsenide uh, would have something like this uh, you can get 10 power 3 uh, gain that is 10 power uh, 3 per inverse centimeter gain uh, and, and this is for uh, let us say electrons right the impact ionization coefficient for electrons whereas for uh, holes right the impact ionization is slightly lesser the coefficient is slightly lesser okay uh, so that is uh, you know typical numbers for uh, uh, for indium gallium arsenide so this is indium gallium arsenide on the other hand if you uh, look at uh, silicon silicon actually has uh, even lower impact ionization coefficient okay so that is something like this um, but significantly when we look at the impact ionization coefficient for holes in silicon so this is for electron and this is for holes um, that is even lower much lower compared to uh, the impact ionization for electrons okay um, so what is the uh, corollary of this uh, so what does this all mean uh, to understand that we need to actually or, or how do you first of all trigger this impact ionization uh, mechanism okay what are the typical uh, type of structures that are used for this well you would still use uh, a pin structure so, I start with uh, what we drew before, right, I would still have a relatively small uh, uh, P region, so uh, let us say it is heavily doped P plus and then you have this uh, I region and then you go to this region and here uh, you have like before we have a N region, let us just call that it is it's highly doped end region so we call it as n plus now what if we can add one more uh, layer over here and a, a p with a p type layer okay so what happens in this sort of case well of course we know that uh, because of the charge transfer that happens at these interfaces uh, let me just represent this in a different color I am um, going to uh, from the p type I am going to leave behind some negative charges over here ok. Similarly on this side also I am going to leave some negative charges ok and over here I am going to leave some positive charges ok. So, so it is fixed ions uh, over there. So, because of this when you look at the electric field across the structure ok. Um, so, let me just draw this out here. If I am plotting the electric field across the structure, the electric field is going to be something like this. It is going to increase over here. This is the magnitude of the electric field and then it is going to remain almost constant over here and over here there is actually a sudden change in the um, charge density. So, accordingly there is going to be an increase in the electric field and then there is going to be a decrease ok and then it goes back to uh, 0 beyond this. Um, so, this is different, this is different in the structure compared to the previous structure of the PIN uh, photodiode where the electric field was uh, constant across this entire uh, uh, region, entire I region. Um, but what we have done is we have actually uh, added one more layer over here ok, where you have a much higher electric field. So, when you 
apply an external bias to this. So when I connect this to uh, just a reverse bias like we did before, right? If I if I connect it to a reverse bias and I increase this bias voltage, uh, if I increase the reverse bias, then uh, my uh, this peak is going to keep on increasing. Okay, and you can uh, get to a point where the field levels are somewhere like like this. Okay, and uh, so that may happen somewhere over here, right? So you, you may achieve that threshold at, at this sort of a level and uh, any higher uh, voltage than that, uh, that corresponds to a higher field, you're going to have even higher uh, impact ionization coefficient, okay. So, so th this is what happens, so this, this uh, threshold actually uh, be, if you go beyond that you start having a lot of impact ionization co uh, events happening and then because of that you will uh, have uh, a large multiplicative uh, gain happening. So, so essentially like before what we are doing is we have this incoming light Pn and uh, that is getting absorbed all along the I region. And uh, because of that, you generate an electron hole pair. The electron moves this way, the hole moves this way, okay. Then the electron is actually, as it's going through this medium, it's getting accelerated and it has so much momentum that it generates this, uh, uh, it basically uh, uh, undergoes this, uh, or triggers this impact ionization and then beyond that it generates much many more uh, electron hole pairs okay which are once again because of the large field here they are they are swept across uh, this this uh, region and then it, it, it generates uh, photocurrent in the external uh, field, external circuit okay so um, if we were to um, quantify this uh, you would want to quantify this in terms of the uh, current that is generated in terms of the uh, photo current that is generated and uh, that can actually be uh, written as uh, like this um, uh, d i over d x let us say this is uh, x uh, that is the spatial parameter d i over d x is uh, given by uh, alpha e which corresponds to the impact ionization coefficient for electrons uh, times i e okay because it the the current uh, due to um, impact ionization of electrons uh, that's that's what we are generate, uh, we are denoting as i e it it goes as this rate plus you could ha also have electrons uh, generated because of impact ionization of holes. So you could you could also have alpha h i h. Okay. Um, so so that is also possible. Now you'd want to say that if I can get uh, both electrons as well as holes generating my impact ionization okay then I can get larger gain so um, basically in this picture what it says is that if this is the uh, threshold for electrons my uh, whole threshold is so is somewhere over here okay because the uh, the holes take a larger electric field uh, to to generate that sort of uh, multiplicative gain so that gets triggered over there. So you would say just keep increasing it and, and then uh, have holes also participate like this hole can now uh, cause uh, impact ionization and, and they can also uh, generate electron, secondary electron hole pairs. Um, well that, that would be a good thought except for the fact that 
this impact ionization process is a is a random process okay you cannot say that one electron is going to generate 10 electron hole pairs exactly it it could be uh, 8 at some time it could be uh, 12 at some time it could be 15 at some time or it could be even 5 at some some other time and so on so it's actually a random process so we know that any random process can be um, characterized by a certain variance and that variance is essentially noise in our process okay so just the impact ionization process itself is expected to have a certain variance and, and uh, expected to have a certain uh, uh, generate a certain noise okay so you you cannot actually uh, have both electrons as well as holes participating because if the holes also are, are generating their own random process uh, then the corresponding generated current is going to be uh, that much more uh, noisy okay so there comes a point beyond which uh, the avalanche process actually defeats the purpose you uh, up to a certain point you have uh, uh, this multiplicative gain improving the responsivity but then beyond a certain point it also introduces so much noise that the signal to noise ratio is not increasing okay so that is actually a key point uh, to note so uh, you have what is called an uh, optimum bias voltage as far as uh, operating avalanche photodiodes are concerned. The optimum bias voltage is determined by uh, how far is the threshold for the holes from the threshold for the electron. Okay. Um, so from that perspective you can say that in silicon the uh, difference between electrons and holes are uh, so much higher the impact ionization coefficient that the threshold for holes is at a much higher level so you are able to keep increasing your bias voltage and keep getting higher and higher multiplicative gain um, for, a, for a silicon uh, photodiode without incurring extra noise um, you know up to a certain voltage uh, so that voltage is, is, is much higher for silicon compared to indium gallium arsenide so you are able to effectively get much higher uh, optimum gain values for silicon compared to indium gallium arsenide that's the takeaway point okay but um, but in general this is uh, what we call as uh, uh, this structure is what we call as uh, a separate absorption because this is where the absorption is happening primarily and uh, this region is where the multiplication is happening so it's a separate absorption multiplication uh, uh, photodiode so that's that that structure is called a sam apd okay so this particular uh, design is called a sam apd and that's one of the more popular uh, apds that you find out there um, of course like i said this is not only generating uh, a current uh, uh, due to these electrons it's also generating a current due to uh, holes right and that's actually going in the opposite direction that's why the, there is this minus sign here but that's also given by i i e alpha e i e plus alpha h i h okay now we can solve these rate equations and um, with uh, certain boundary conditions uh, boundary conditions are essentially saying that the avalanche process is triggered by this electron coming from this region and there are uh, there are no holes coming from this region the whole current is uh, zero when you start from with uh, some of those uh, uh, sort of uh, boundary conditions and the charge neutrality uh, which says that whenever an electron is generated there is also a hole that is generated right so the uh, uh, you know the electron current and the hole current is uh, is is the uh, sum of both of those is a constant and that's uniform across the entire structure so you can uh, 
do all of this and then uh, you can actually uh, represent uh, you can actually get an expression for this you can solve these equations and you can get an expression for the multiplicative gain okay um, that gain value happens to be uh, you know you can call that as m okay uh, m is actually expressed in terms of the uh, impact ionization coefficients uh, and it is uh, convenient to um, represent this ratio of this impact ionization coefficients. Uh, let us say this is the, so um, this is the II ratio impact ionization ratio Ka which is given by impact ionization coefficient for uh, holes divided by impact ionization coefficient for electrons. Okay. Um, so, just a quick word about the value of Ka. The value of Ka can be anything from 0 to um, you know infinity, right. So, uh, it depends on the relative values of uh, uh, the impact ionization for holes and uh, uh, electrons. So, which is a, which is a good value um, to get you know optimum gain? Well, you can say that if Ka equals to 1, in which case you know impact ionization coefficient for holes is the same as that for electrons. If that is the case then both of them have the same threshold and both of them are participating in this process in this avalanche process and they generate a lot of noise. So, overall you were not going to get a very good uh, gain from this uh, process without uh, um, without without incurring uh, significant noise, okay. So it it becomes counterproductive. On the other hand, if k is closer to zero, let's say alpha e is far far greater than alpha h. Let's say for the for for example in silicon, that's what we see. Alpha e is far far greater than its order of magnitude greater than that for uh, holes. If that is the case, then k is a very small value, okay. And uh, that means there is a large gap between these two thresholds. So, only one type of charge carrier in this case the electron is generating all the impact ionization events. Okay. So, uh, that is actually a preferable uh, condition and, and then that would also result in a higher uh, multiplicative gain. So, let us actually quantify that. Um, so, if like I said if you work out this rate equations with the boundary conditions and all, um, you can you come up with an expression like this which is given by uh, m equal to 1 minus k a divided by uh, exponential of minus 1 minus k a multiplied by alpha e w m. Uh, so, I have not defined w m yet. w m corresponds to the width of this multiplication region. So, this is my w m. Okay. So, this minus k a. Okay. So, that is actually uh, the expression for the multiplicative gain which uh, which depends on uh, Ka, uh, which is actually a constant for any given material. So, you can pick the material based on uh, uh, its, its value of Ka. And then um, uh, what are the other parameters? You have alpha E, okay, which uh, you can control. How do you control alpha E? Well, if you go back and look at this uh, graph, it is controlled by uh, controlling the electric field. And how do you control the electric field? By controlling the bias voltage that you have here, the V bias, right. So, by controlling V bias, you can actually control alpha E and WM is actually a parameter that you design up front uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, it is a, it's a relatively small value, smaller than the uh, width of the intrinsic region typically, okay. So, um, so that is actually the uh, expression for uh, 
uh, m. So, let us actually look into this in a little more detail and to do that let me actually uh, try to copy this. Okay, and let me just go to a fresh page. So, what we are looking at is this uh, expression for the uh, gain. The this is actually the multiplicative gain for uh, for an APD, right? Uh, so, let us just plot this and see what it means. Okay, so, on the uh, y axis I am looking at uh, m which starts from 1 and uh, it can go to 10, uh, 100 and so on. Um, whereas, uh, in, in the y axis I have uh, alpha e w m. Uh, which is uh, actually representative of uh, the V by S because that is what you are changing uh, to, to change alpha E W M. Okay. And uh, uh, so that is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. Right. Um, so, if you have uh, something like this, um, let us actually look at uh, two extreme conditions. One is where uh, k a equals to uh, 0. Okay. If k a equals to 0, then uh, this becomes 0, this becomes 0, then this also becomes 0. So, then you have exponential of uh, uh, alpha e w m. Okay. So, that would uh, correspond to something like this. So, this is actually k a equal to 0. Okay. Um, and then uh, the other condition is uh, when uh, k a equals to uh, 1. Okay. If k a equals to 1, then this becomes 1 and then if you substitute uh, here, this is also 1. So, that is 0. So, the whole thing is uh, is 1. Uh, so, 1 minus 1 that, that is the denominator is going to be 0. So, that is indeterminable. So, you hospitals rule uh, and, and, and then you uh, work it out. Uh, what you will find is uh, for that condition it will tend to be asymptotic. It will work out to be 1 over 1 minus alpha e w m right and uh, so that will be asymptotic with respect to uh, with respect to this value of 1. So, so it will be something like this. So, this is for uh, k a equal to 1. And for uh, other values of k a, for example, silicon is uh, k a is 0.1. So, then it will look something like this 0.1 for silicon and k a is uh, uh, 0.5 for uh, indium gallium arsenide. So, so this is k a equal to 0.5 indium gallium gallium arsenide. Okay. So, so you, you look at this picture and you say uh, k a equal to 1 seems to be a very good condition because of the fact that um, even for very small values of alpha e or very small values of bias voltage you can get a very high gain. But that is only one part of the picture. We have not actually started talking about noise that is generated from avalanche photodiode. From a perspective of noise you will find that this is actually the most noisy condition. Um, whereas, you know, k equal to 0, it, it although it says that uh, it is a very slowly evolving exponential, um, nevertheless, you would find that uh, for this condition, you will, you will have, uh, you will be able to go to much higher uh, 
levels of gain ok. So, we will uh, look at some of these uh, finer future features uh, uh, soon in the next lecture.